If you start a new podcast and you don't know how or even where to post and distribute, try Anchor. Anchor is a free podcasting platform that lets you record and edit from your phone and your computer. It distributes your show to all the major podcasting platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, as well as many others. Once you're ready to upload, it's as easy as dragging and dropping your file, and Anchor does the rest. Once you get started, Anchor will even match you with sponsors so you can get paid to podcast as soon as your show gets live. Go on over to anchor.fm slash start or download the free Anchor app to get started today. Once again, that is anchor.fm slash start or the free Anchor app to get started. Happy podcasting. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to History of Horror Episode 1. It's been a long time coming. I think it's been about two months since I officially announced History of Horror as a series under We Came From Beneath the Sea. And well, it, it's time. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. I really do. Um, still trying to iron out some bugs. It's just me talking by myself. It is a little awkward. I hope you guys bear with me. I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, tune in next time to when I ever have a History of War episode. Because it takes a while to uh, to get it done. Please love it. Please. Do you ever wonder why you get scared? Is it that bump in the night that makes you jump? Or the cat scurrying across the street. Maybe it's the fear that lingers after the TV clicks off long after the movies end. And you see your reflection in the blank screen. Are you alone in the house? What was that shadow? Are you sure of what you saw? What's your favorite scary movie? Let's find out. Welcome to the History of Horror. If we look at every civilization in human history, we can see that each one of them has had an odd obsession with the macabre. The Aztecs and the Mayans had their human sacrifices. The Romans had the gladiators in the Colosseum. Hell, the French had the guillotine executions that followed the French Revolution. But still, there was one more unsettling institution in France that came along after these executions. That would be the Théâtre du Grand Guignol, which I would deem the granddaddy of horror films. But before we even dive into that, horror and dark themes have been prevalent in theater for centuries, with playwrights like Shakespeare, Decker, and Webster clipping these in their plays throughout their careers. Before the creation of the Grand Guignol, French newspapers used to run stories called Fait de Verre. These were strange but true crime tales. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, they also used to run stories called Pixie Bricor, which were basically melodramas which mainly told the tales of victims under an oppressor getting revenge and rising above their oppression, usually with a sense of divine punishment. The fate of heirs were very heavy in emotion due to their true-to-life nature, while the melodramas ended on a happier note of victory. The important style in this instance were the fate of heirs, as they led to the creation of the Grand Guignol style. Before the Grand Guignol, there was a subgenre of theater called the Naturalist Movement. This genre followed the true-to-life nature, like the Fade de Vers, and this meant there were no spirits or gods to intervene in human action. One of the first naturalist theaters to open was the Theater Libre, founded by André Antoine. What made this theater stand out from others at the time, instead of directly acting to the audience, the actors they ignored they even had one, and so this broke the norm and made this acting style stand out from the status quo. Further the revolving from the Theater Libre's documentary style, uh, the creation of the Ross play came along and leaned even heavier into the disturbed. It was this primal state of mind, an entire world of crime on stage. The heart of this movement was the antithesis to the bourgeoisie. The real appeal of the Ross play was there was no moral sense of good or evil. And so this man, named Oscar Metmier, who was the former secretary of the Parisian police commissioner, uh, he was a writer of tabloid-esque journals and was considered one of the masters of the Ross play. Uh, Metnir was a co-founder of the Theatre Libre and gave André Antoine his most controversial plays. Uh, Metnir scoured Paris's red light district uh, for inspiration on the naturalist material. He always brought an organic authenticity to his character's dialogue and atmosphere. He was one of the first naturalist playwrights to exhibit sympathy for his low-life character. Metnir also kept his plays really short and sweet, never going over 15 minutes for work for his Ross plays. By 1893, Metnir and Antoine grew apart. Antoine wanted to rid himself of the Ross play. Quote, in its unpredictability, it was predictable. End quote. 
1993, the theater blew away closed due to financial instability, but Metnir didn't end his career here. In 1897, he founded the Theater du Grand Guignol. Named after the famous Punch and Judy puppet show character Guignol, the literal translation means large puppet show. It was a grim satire that appealed to the adults of Paris. The building that the theater resided in was a ransacked church, and by the time Metnir came into possession of it, there had already been a stage installed, but a measly one at that. The house was still arranged like pews, and the stone masonry gave off all these gothic vibes that were just... The balcony seats were built like confession boxes, so in a sort, you could ask forgiveness for the monstrosities you were going to see on stage. The theater was described as claustrophobic, which heightened the scares and the acoustics, which, as you know, for actors, that's just, that's perfect, my man. The inaugural show at the Theater du Grand Guignol was held on April 13th of 1897. The first program consisted of seven plays, deeming its opening a success. Metnir wanted to keep the repertoire to differentiate from the Theater Libre, and each play complemented one another. Mel Gordon went on to describe A Night at the Grand Guignol by taking hot and cold showers. Following the first season of the theater, A Night at the Play would, would play out like this. Uh, to raise the curtain, we'd have a slapstick, slapstick comedy. Uh, the s next up would be a light drama. After that, a comedy. And then after that would be the horror play of the week. And then to end the night, there would be a farce. These plays could be swapped out or repeated at any time at will from week to week. By using this hot and cold shower style of presenting shows, it basically saved the Continental one-act play. To accommodate the repertoire of the Grand Guignol, Metnair divided his Ross plays into two categories. Plays of popular manners, which were virtually, virtually actionless dramas of Parisian lowlife. Then there were newspaper items, which were modeled after the fate of air. Going to the Grand Guignol was a literary and social venture. It was ever-changing due to the avant-garde attitude in Paris at the time, and Metnir could not keep up with its demands. So, in 1898, Metnir sold the theater to Max Mori, and after closing the deal, Metnir just disappeared into history. Which is sad, He was since he, you know, started this grand adventure. Uh, Max Mori was not a man of the theater before purchasing, especially not of the genre of the Grand Guignol, and Maury was determined to make the Grand Guignol a financial success. He had little desire to experiment. He claimed it was for poets and for painters. He sought out formulas to guarantee terror and fear. Metnir presented a cross-section of life, while Maury's approach was more of a cross-section of death. Maury's Grand Guignol was to be pure theater, a place where every social taboo was to be defied. This was to attract the French masses who ate up tadboid exposés and tales of absolute bloodbath. They were now being satiated with live enactments of gore, of mutilation, of rape, of torture, and murder. Each patron could live out their primal fantasies of being victimized and gaining the warm feeling of obtaining retribution. It's kind of fucked up, but I'm a horror fan, so I kind of get it. Mari didn't rid the theater of all of Metnir's tricks, though. Uh, the hot and cold showers technique did stick around, but it was now called laughter and tears. The plays were now longer and fully developed, and the order came out to be two comedies followed by two horrors, a long, slow rise to a quick fall. The horror was immediate and physically shocking. Maury, a professional perfectionist, was notorious for constantly reworking scenes in rehearsals and feeding the actors lines to ensure perfection on stage. This led the actors to harbor hatred toward Maury. Now, if there was anyone who was single-handedly responsible for the Grand Guignol's long-term success, it was going to be Andre de Lord. Known as the Prince of Terror, de Lord, the son of a physician, had a fascination with the macabre. As a boy, he would sit outside his father's office and listen in on the screams emerging from the room. To try and sway his son from the inclination for the dark and the death, his father took him along to confirm a fresh corpse, and it was here that young Andre de Lord learned that seeing the horrors of the world was not what it was in his mind. De Lord's therapist, Dr. Alfred Binet, who was the director of the psychological physiological laboratory at the Sorbonne claimed that Delord was a poor patient. Delord was always preoccupied with new plans for a play. Instead of focusing on mending his mind and mitting, ridding himself of the dark and complicated psyche he had, Benet often compared Delord to his idol, the great American poet Edgar Allan Poe. Between 1901 and 1926, Andre Delord wrote over a hundred plays of horror in collaboration with novelists and with doctors. Delord also wrote plays for a multitude of other Parisian theaters, 
And aside from being a playwright, the Lord was also a lawyer, the secretary to the minister of finance, and the chief librarian at the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal. The Lord also had a reputation for doing interviews to newspapers and magazines and publishing his horror, ser- horror plays as serials in them, and even went as far as to write documentation of why his works were what they were. At this point, the horror plays of the Grand Guignol were as much the norm as gladiator fights and the not-so-long-ago public executions at the guillotine. Trying to identify with his idol Poe, the Lord wanted to write a play so terrifying that the audiences would clear the building within minutes of the start. As an avid scholar of new trends in psychology and criminal behaviors, the Lord became the first dramatist to set plays in settings such as operating rooms and insane asylums. It was due to the backgrounds in psychology and criminal behaviors that led the Lord to master the two principles to create pure terror in his audiences. By creating plots where the suspense grows until the gruesome end, and the exact opposite, an inevitable conclusion of which audiences could see coming. I love when you can do that in horror films. Like movies especially, I love trying to guess the ending, and if I'm right, you get this wave of happiness, because you got it right. Um, But it was all about the anticipation, and without this anticipation, the sickening conclusions would actually draw laughter, and not fear as intended. When Mari and Delore decided to collaborate, it transformed the Grand Guignol into an elite societal experience. Just as Matinaire uses the Grand Guignol as the slice of life, Delore created a genre chock full of slices of death. It pandered to society's universal dread, and as the attendants showed, the women in this elite society were eating it up. At this point in the Grand Guignol's operation, the presence of medical personnel was no longer a publicity stunt. At least two audience members fainted per night, and shockingly, mainly male patrons who refused to shield their eyes from the gruesome scenes playing out on stage. And the tension was so thick in the air, it even happened during the Bloodless Ross plays. Under Maury's direction and nonstop publicity, the Theatre du Grand Guignol was recognized as unique French entertainment. It was listed in every travel guide in every language they printed them in. Grouped in the same section as the Eiffel Tower, the Maison de Tolerance, which were legalized brothels, Maxims, and the Louvre. By 1910, the Theatre du Grand Guignol had become the best-known tourist attraction in Paris. By 1915, Max Moyer retired, and Camille Choisy took over with his business partner, Charles Zabel. Choisy, a character actor himself, felt that the Grand Guignol was declining. World War I had come and gone, and the terrors of trench warfare had become known to the world. But to Choisy, this had just opened up a gateway to a new site of terror. But in truth, the Grand Guignol reached a new height after World War I. Instead of strictly realistic techniques, Choisy opted to evolve the acting style and elevate it to be more colorful and reinforced it with complicated behavior. As stated in a 1923 press release, the realities of life with its ardors, its violence, its environments, and also its beauties. In hindsight, this truly was the height of the Grand Guignol's popularity. In 1926, Charles Zabel, who had lost most of his fortune during the war and from inflation that followed, sold his share of the theater to Jack Joven. Joven stepped in and made a whole fucking shit show. Uh, he made some grave mistakes. He fired one of the best theaters, one of the theater's best actresses, whose name was Moxa. And then in 1930, he announced a new repertoire, which played down the violence, which was instituted by Andre Delord. Joven kept only three of Delors' original works in the new repertoire. Joven's modern, quote-unquote, modern horror plays were filled with psychological and sexual menace. Joven even implemented themed nights instead of having the hot and cold showers experience. Which, uh, what the fuck, man? Come on, Jack, you fucking shit up here, my guy. Joven wrote a slew of the new plays under pseudonyms, and they were not received very well at all. By the mid-1930s, the Grand Guignol lost its novelty and appeal. Starting around this time was the decline of the Grand Guignol, and well, we all know why. Let's explain. Hollywood sound films, or talkies as they were more formally called, were the Grand Guignol's biggest competitor by the mid-1930s. Hollywood was using the Grand Guignol's techniques of horror and tension, and the cinema was winning. But the show went on. In 1937, British-born actress Eva Berkson bought out Joven's share and rebuilt the Grand Guignol. During her tenure at the theater, she created a play that addressed the Nazis' atrocities in Poland in 1939. And, well, the Grand Guignol flourished up until the German occupation of France in 1940. 
During this occupation, many of Choisy's plays were performed. However, the Grand Union Hall was liquidated and it closed. After the liberation of Paris in 1944, Bergson returned and rebuilt the theater. At first, theatergoers were hesitant, but once the war was officially over, it became the spot for American soldiers in Paris, even having General George Patton in attendance at one point. These post-war years were the hardest on Bergson. The horrors of Nazi death camps were enough horror for potential audiences, and horror just was not appealing for the time being. The horrors were shown on stage were being met with laughter. Between 1951 and 1954, Charles Nonon, the company manager, took over for a short period for Max Maury's sons. It was during this time we saw a dip in the show quality and a further decline in society. There were slip-ups on stage, a few ending in injuries, an actress who got stuck in a leather contraption was almost hung on stage, another actor was very badly burned. It was not looking very good for the Theatre du Grand Guignol. By 1961, Nonon took over again. He went on record stating, We could never equal Buchenwald. Before the war, everyone felt what was happening on stage was impossible. Now we know that these things, and worse, are possible in reality. In 1962, the Theatre du Grand Union closed its doors forever. There were small pornographic shows, kind of like porn parodies, over the town in the same vein, but the Grand Union was dead. In March 1963, the building was renovated and the iconic doors and the marquee were destroyed forever. The Grand Union still does hold influence in modern times. It virtually shaped the motion picture industry and it paved the way for the horror we see on screens today. Todd Browning, who you most likely know as the director of Universal's Dracula in 1930, made Freaks in 1932, which is a very, very controversial film which I will be covering on either History of Horror for sure as a deep dive episode, or I might do it on We Came From Beneath the Sea with Zach and Brandon just to see what the fuck they think about this movie. Uh, Todd Browning was a master at translating the Grand Union Hall to the big screen, and you can really tell in Freaks. I highly recommend you guys go check Freaks out. It's a pre-code film, uh, and it's really fucked up. Like, look up the history on it, you'll be pretty shocked. So... Grand Guignol is closed. You know, the film industries took over. Everyone wants to go see the, the moving pictures on, on the movie theater screens. And the horror theater is dead. Um, no, that's just a fact of life, you know. Like, we had blockbuster video and video stores in the early 2000s, the late 90s, and, you know, in the 80s, obviously. And so, you know, and then, you know, Redbox and Netflix kind of just fucked them over and pushed them out. Which, you know, that's the most modern uh, iteration of this, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is kind of sad, honestly. You know, I read through this book, uh, which again I will mention, uh, is The Theater of Fear and Horror, The Grisly Spectacle of the Grand Guignol of Paris, 1897 to 1962 by Mel Gordon. A really wonderful read. It's 20 bucks on Amazon for a paperback copy. Highly recommend you guys get this book, even... I only used two sections, um, and I used the history and the stage tricks. No, I didn't use stage tricks. I used history and the influence, and they have stage tricks that they use. They even have plays at the the ending half of the book that you can read through, which is awesome. I read a few of them. Pretty good stuff. Um, but yeah, like even you know, Psycho up in 1960 used tricks of the Grand Guignol on screen. So you know, it, it's impacts were felt over the course of film history, which I think is awesome. And these really were the precursor to horror films before motion pictures were ever viable, you know? And so, yeah, the Grand Guignol, an institution in Paris that I wish would would honestly come back. I would love to go back in time and see some Grand Guignol uh, theater plays. I think I would have really enjoyed them. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening to episode one of History of Horror. I know it was a little rough. Uh, sorry about that. I'm going to iron out these bugs as soon as possible. Uh, tune into episode two. I don't know what it's going to be or when it will be out, but it is coming. I guarantee it. Uh, actually, if you guys want to vote, go to Twitter. Go on our Twitter, at WeBeneath, and I will put a poll up. Uh, between two two topics and you guys can duke it out and choose and I'll do whatever 
You guys choose. I'll do that. That sounds like a plan. All right, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Anyway, I hope you guys are staying safe out there. We are still in a global pandemic. Well, not a global. America's still in a pandemic. Okay? Uh, be safe. Wear a mask. And, you know, be kind to each other. I love you guys. Tune in to We Came From What You Can See. Tune in to the rest of the shows in the SlasherCast Podcast Network. I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.